Good night, students. My name is Professor Winston Moore. I'm the deputy principal here at the UWI Cayfield campus. Um, as you're aware, COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, has been the subject of a significant amount of media discussion. On the 11th of March yesterday, the WHO Director General noted that, w, that the WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock and we are deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. The WHO therefore declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Now, essentially what we're hoping to do tonight is give you a bit more information on what that means for you as a student, what that means for the University of the West Indies, and what sort of precautions you should be taking as a student here at the UWI. Tonight, I have with me an expert panel of healthcare professionals who will explain what is COVID-19, discuss the symptoms, and field any questions you might have about COVID-19. I'm gonna start from my far, far left. Dr. Rufus Ewan is a PAHO advisor on health systems and development for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. And he'll give you a background on health systems within the Caribbean and can speak about PAHO on, on the whole idea of COVID-19 at a very general level. And also give you some idea of the trends in regards to COVID-19. Tez Wright is Dr. Tania Whitby Bess, who you should be familiar with, who's the medical officer at the Student Health Clinic, and she will be giving you some advice in terms of being safe on campus. And you can answer, answer the entire panel any questions that you might have about COVID-19. And then to my right, to her right, is Dr. Kenneth Connell, who's a lecturer in clinical pharmacology at the UWI Cable cam Campus, as well as president of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados and a consultant internist at the QEH. And he'll give you an idea of um, COVID-19 policy in Barbados so far, what Barbados has been doing to um, stop the spread of COVID-19. And you can also ask him about any issues you might have in regards to COVID-19 as well. So I'm gonna give each person the opportunity to make very short presentations because I know you probably have a lot of questions. So we're gonna focus um, primarily on the questions tonight. And, but I'll allow each individual to make a uh, very few opening remarks and then we'll get to your questions. If you can, please utilize the mics. Um, you have mics um, to the right. Um, there's also hopefully gonna be a floating mic um, to use. If you're not comfortable with the mics, um, we'll understand. And just try to project your voice as, as far as possible, okay? So first starting with Dr. Ewing, can you? Um, please start. Thank you, Deputy Principal, and uh, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, this evening, I would like to just bring to you a, a general picture of what is COVID-19. Um, the virus that caused that caused COVID-19, which is called uh, this disease, is called coronavirus disease, COVID-19. The virus is a SARS and COVID-2 um, um, virus. First discovered in Wuhan, China. Uh, it was thought to have come from animal source and then trans and entered into the humans. Now. This is the first time this virus is being, is being exposed uh, to humans, so our immune system um, is not known to it. And the reason why we are, there's so much to do about this virus is simply that, that it's the first exposure to humans. Uh, there's no known vaccine, no known treatment, and it's causing uh, severe disease and death. To date, there are about 125 individuals so far have been known to be confirmed with, with the coronavirus disease. Um, the majority of them still reside in China, about 80,000 but, but 80, in China. But since the outbreak in China and up to this date, about 117 countries globally uh, have been uh, impacted by the virus, 
in, uh, in, in, in several of those countries, we have what we call community in-country transmission. In-country transmission simply means that for those persons diagnosed with the disease, there is no known linkages to anyone with the disease from other countries. Uh, so you acquire the disease within your community uh, in those particular countries. Um, the symptoms range from fever, anywhere from 100 degrees uh, up, dry cough, um, some malaise, shortness of breath. The majority of the cases of this disease are um, mild, about 80% of the, of the individual ex experience mild symptoms. Um, about 15% of those individuals uh, with the disease will go on to having severe, uh, severe disease um, and the majority of them end up in the, of those 5% or more of those individuals end up having some kind of multi-system organ failure and that. Now, what we find found with that is the majority of individuals who succumb to the disease are of elderly age, persons like greater than 60, and with other comorbid conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, etc. cetera. Uh, so hopefully the, the younger age groups are kind of um, does not have a severe disease, but it's still a significant public health impact that we can, that you can have on our society within, uh, uh, that we know it here, especially in university communities. Within the Caribbean region, um, we have several countries now uh, where the disease have been diagnosed within our Caribbean region. We have at least five countries within our Eastern Caribbean regions to date um, where the disease have been diagnosed. Barbados, fortunately, as yet, is not one of those countries. Um, but it does not mean that we have to be relaxed, and this is why the university is taking the appropriate steps uh, in public health education and educating you so that you can be more aware of the disease, so that you can prepare yourself uh, so that you will not contract the disease and spread it to others, and so that you can act appropriately in terms of make the right steps if you find out that you're infected with the, with the disease and contact the relevant authorities, which will be discussed to you, with you um, through your um, campus uh, physician. So you, I'm sure you may have a lot of questions during the course of our discussions here today, and I'm here to answer most of those questions for you uh, to alleviate your fears, your anxiety, um, that you may be uh, seeing on television uh, and other countries around the world. Um, the most important thing for you, don't panic, just take some simple measures that we will discuss with you here today and everything will be okay. Okay? Thank you very much. Next speaker is Dr. Kenneth Connell. touch the mic. Okay. So, well, good evening, uh, Deputy Principal and, and colleagues. Uh, let me say it's a pleasure speaking to you this evening. Although I have the opportunity to speak to several publics, my favorite public is always the students because you, you stimulate the discussion in a way that no other group can. So, I am speaking to you in my capacity, not as president of the Heart and Stroke Foundation at all, but really as chair of the campus's Medical and Health Services Committee. As an internist, we deal with disease outbreaks, and infectious disease outbreak is an example of this with COVID-19. I also hope to alleviate your fear, but whilst I was parked here and I watched several of you walking across to LT4, some of you touching your faces as well, I wanted to share some of the thoughts I kind of thought were unique to a university community, because I think this is a distinct community and you have a, an extra responsibility. And so my four points are these before we open the, the floor. I hope that you would be responsible. We are currently managing not just a viral pandemic. We are managing an infodemic. Where there's a lot of fake news. Even as a, as a practicing internist for almost 20 years, I have to sometimes think to myself, is that really real? Because it's being packaged so attractively that even I get confused. And I can appreciate that you that are not medically trained, some of you may also get confused. 
you need to be responsible. Don't encourage the spread of fake media. Don't encourage people in saying that, you know, if you stand on the next to this bush at 12 in the morning, it will protect you from COVID. Uh, act sensibly as a university student. I also want you to be alert. Uh, so, for instance, in this room, some of you might have noticed the person sitting next to you might have been touching their face. I would expect that when you leave the room, you would say something like, you know, you really shouldn't be touching your face that often. That's one public health measure that you should try, we should try to avoid. Or you should use hand sanitizer gel, walk around with it some more. Or you should wash your hands with soap and water. You should continue to coach each other because we all get it wrong. And, and your, your technique. So, for instance, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, that supreme uh, institution for healthcare, and one of my colleagues is in the front smiling at me. Uh, even as practicing healthcare physicians, we get it wrong. What percentage do you think of people who were caught just randomly on the wards, washing their hands, did so correctly? This, these aren't patients or their relatives. These are people who are trained healthcare pro providers. What percentage would you say, would you guess, got it right? More than 90%? Uh, 70 to 90? Really? Okay. Uh, 50 to 70? Uh, less than 50? Yeah. It's actually even, well, I said less than 50, it's less than 30%. Yeah, I mean, you would be surprised because hand washing isn't just gelling up and rubbing your hands together and getting some water, rinsing it off and just continuing. It is a structured technique. The WHO has stated that they want you to do things in a particular way. Wash hands for at least 20 seconds. But of course, I've always had a problem with that because you could wash hands incorrectly for 20 seconds as well if you don't cover all the surfaces. So there are going to be lots of videos, at least uh, posted on the media sites. You should take a look at it to make sure that you're washing your hands correctly with soap and water. Hand sanitizer really does sound cool. Everyone likes to kind of pull out their hand sanitizer, do a little squirt. One student I saw at a university is currently on suspension for selling his colleagues squirts of hand sanitizer as they enter the lecture hall. But, but we should use soap and water. I mean, hand sanitizer is really when you cannot really avoid it. So get the sinks, wash your hands with soap and water. Your hands are only sanitized if they are wet, then dry not wet then damp or wet then clammy or wet then partially tapped. They have to be dry hands to be sanitized. So dry your hands carefully and don't touch the door with your sanitized hands as you leave. Use tissue to do so as you exit. I also think that you should be leaders in this and that your communities, whether it's in the university setting or outside, that you will lead on this in encouraging them safe practice. I was in Price Mart today as well, not Price Gorging. I just went for one container of milk and uh, I coughed in the line. And it didn't even dawn on me what coughing the impact that might have on people. Uh, but everyone, of course, looked around as if it was a plague. Uh, so you, you, should be, you should be alert, but you should also act sensibly. Now, currently in this country, Barbados is still at phase stage zero, which means that we don't have a confirmed or suspected case, but there are international cases. There's a whole response, and, and although everyone would like to be the response to be at phase three, Although we're at phase zero, there's a stepwise response. Some countries have made very drastic uh, draconian measures. Some have made measures that are not evidence-based at all, but they're just cool to say, like banning certain countries from coming to their country uh, to prevent the spread of a virus. But all the public health measures have to be evidence-based. You just can't randomly throw them out there to make people feel better about doing them. So I'm going to take your questions as relates on campus. One major intervention on campus has been public education. We've been obsessive, and Mr. Lovell has left, about what information is sent to you, where it's coming from, how it's sourced, how it's sent to you, those kind of things, because we want to make sure that you are getting the best information. You're not pulling it off of just a random YouTube video. It has to be from, we've decided to use WHO videos for this purpose. There's also campus surveillance. We have a responsibility as an institution to, to be part of surveillance. Uh, and we expect that if you see something suspicious that you'll report it, not to me, but to the campus, campus uh, doctor so that 
it can be reported on to the ministry. There's a national hotline as well, which works. Well, it's 24-7. I didn't try it every hour, but I did try it at 2 a.m. and someone answered. Uh, so it works. So you should use the national hotline uh, when you have. Do not go to the clinic. I know we say this, and of course someone's going to say, I have a fever, or I feel warm like after a hot shower, and uh, I'm going to go to the clinic because I'm sick. Do not go to the clinic. You're putting others at risk. This is one situation where, unlike the disease that I tend to manage more, the public health concern takes priority. And you have to be careful not just about your own health, but how are you affecting the health of your community. I'm going to stop there and introduce Dr. Tanya Whitby Bess, who some of you know very well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good night, everyone. Um, I think Dr. Connell saw some of my notes and stole it. So <laughs> I will just carry on from what he has said in terms of being safe on campus. Um, I know several persons are very concerned, and especially you mentioned about coughing. Please remember people cough for various reasons all the time. Since I've been in this room, I counted at least five persons who coughed, including myself, right? Um, so we don't want to say, oh, somebody's coughing and create unnecessary panic um, because it doesn't necessarily mean they do have the virus. Based on the information that is coming out, we expect at least 88% of persons who are going to have COVID-19 will have a fever. And a fever usually about 38 degrees um, Celsius. Cough is another symptom. We expect about 68% of persons will have a cough. Now, persons are concerned about runny, stuffy nose, but that's way down the bottom of the list. Most of the patients with COVID-19 will not have runny, stuffy nose. So persons may have something else like influenza or the common cold, which is always going around, always in season, okay? So we need to be mindful of that, that we don't let anyone feel as, you know, we all run out the room and leave them and um, discriminate. Remember, at this point, there are no confirm up until now I haven't heard otherwise 738 confirmed case of the virus in Barbados All right so it means then that um, we're not looking at local spread we're not worried about that so we're still going to be looking at travel history as a part of the risk factor for someone having COVID-19 so if someone has not left Barbados in 10 months and they cough in and they haven't been in contact with someone who traveled from a high-risk area, it's less likely, okay? Remember, there are other illnesses that make people cough, all right? Um, in terms of mask, because we've had one or two persons asking for mask, asking if they should wear a mask. Remember, masks are reserved for ill persons, and what we'll do if you come to the clinic with flu-like symptoms, we will ask you to put on a mask, again, as a measure to protect others, okay? And masks are for healthcare workers who are dealing with the persons who are ill and who are act actually at one of the highest risk of, of, of um, contracting the virus. So no widespread mass hysteria to try and buy masks. They're already in short supply. So if everyone is using masks willy-nilly, when we need it, we might not be able to get any, okay? So that's my take on mask. Um, he spoke about going to Price Mart and people filling up trolleys with 15 cases of toilet paper or something. Um, I do believe that you can look into getting maybe extra supplies, but not 15, you know, why? If we do end up with cases, there might be limitations in being able to go out and get supplies. You want to probably decrease the amount of times you have to go out. So you might want to have just a little extra while things are settling down, not the whole supermarket, right? Um, that would not be fair to others because then we want everyone to be able to, to, to function and, and, and have something to eat and have different supplies, right? For persons who are on medication that they need, may consider having a little extra also, just in case pharmacies might not be readily available. And 
if we do have the clinic, you can call the clinic if you have a question or if you're concerned about someone who may have traveled, have symptoms, or you yourself, um, you could call. If you're ill, try to distance yourself from others. The recommendation is three feet, and that's easily counted three tiles. These tiles are 12 inches each. That's easy to count, about three feet or a meter away from others. When you cough, tissue, throw away, wash or sanitize your hands right after. People still coughing in their hands, touching doorknobs, touching everything. Coughing your elbow, okay? It's hard to not touch your face, and your face always itch when you don't want to touch it. Mine was itching like crazy, and <laughs> right? But you have to just try and be conscious and, and go, okay, I'm not sure if my hands are clean, so I'll try not to touch my face. Avoid mouth, ears, nose. Um, sorry, mouth, ears, no, eyes, eyes. nose. <laughs> Men. Avoid touching men. Mouth, eyes, <laughs> and nose, right? M-E-N. That's an easy way to remember it, okay? Not, not men as in the... Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. And if you're a high person who travels to a high-risk area or an area that the numbers are consistently increasing and you experience any symptoms, yes, please call ahead. The hot, hotline works, but you can call the clinic. Um, and we can help to guide um, to, mo to, to mobilize services so that you can be tested, okay? Remember, you might be fit and healthy and young, but there may be other persons, even though they're young, you don't know who has a heart condition, you don't know who has diabetes, you don't know who has hypertension. So we want to make sure we try to protect everyone as much as possible, okay? Um, and that's it for now. In the event of if there's any... Um, cases and any shutdown clinic services, we will still try to make sure there's some form of access to the services in terms of even by use of some form of telemedicine forum or something or by telephone so that, you know, we know students will still have other illnesses and other concerns and we'd want to try and help as much as possible. All right, thank you. So I'm going to have to put my hands in my pockets now not to touch my face. So, um, Dr. Whitby Best, the number for the clinic, what? The clinic number? Okay. The clinic number is 417-4170. Um, if you don't think you remember or you forgot where you stored it, you can always Google. UEKville Clinic, and it will come up. Okay. And Dr. Connell, you mentioned the national hotline number. What is that number? Right, so the COVID hotline. Are you ready? Get your phones ready. So 536-4500. 536-4500. 24-7. Don't test it like me on necessarily at 2 a.m., but it, <laughs> they, will ask, they will ask you 24-7. And, and why are we calling that hotline number? So you're calling that number if you have any questions generally about COVID-19 and be reasonable, don't call up at 3 a.m. to say, you know, I was wondering if it was a bacteria or was it a virus. <laughs> and, so, but if you have legitimate questions about COVID-19 during the day, for instance, you can call that hotline, you'll get information. But more importantly, if you have suspect, suspected symptoms, such as the high fever or the dry cough, we've been saying cough a lot, but it's really a dry cough, uh, not just a wet sounding hacking cough call that hotline number. If you think that you might be at risk, like you came in contact with someone who said, by the way, I have COVID-19, I'm just keeping it undercover, <laughs> then it's your civic responsibility to report it as well. Uh, the healthcare professionals at the ministry take it very seriously and they will investigate. Okay. All right, okay. Let's take some questions. Yes, please. Well, I, I can answer to the persons coming in the clinic. They're screened, and I can't say I've seen anyone that I suspected 
would have had COVID-19. Um, you can go ahead with it. So, so, so testing, national testing is done by the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and it's based on suspicion. So anyone coming with a, any fever isn't going to get tested. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole algorithm that you go through. Now, testing is an important thing. If you've watched CNN or even walked past any media, um, you probably have heard the, the problems with testing because testing, of course, allows us to know the true mortality rate for the disease. Uh, mortality rates have been quoted from various countries, but there's always a problem with the denominator, the lower number, how many people actually really have the disease and how many people have died from it. It's easy to confirm death, but how many people have the disease? Mm -hmm. So you have to test widely. Now, one country who will remain nameless has not done wide testing and are having <laughs> problems in predicting mortality rates. Of course, as a small island developing country, you have to kind of balance how much money you can spend on testing everyone, which would, I guess would be not ideal anyway, mm -hmm. versus testing those people that are suspected. So Barbados was actually, and I, we can say this, uh, the first Caribbean country to have testing available. Mm -hmm. uh, and testing is available. It takes four hours, uh, which isn't a long time, to, to get a test result. It's a nasopharyngeal swab. Yeah. Anyone mm -hmm. who's had a nasopharyngeal swab knows that it's not a riveting experience. Uh, so it's where you, it's a swab that goes through the nostril and it's, yeah. I didn't mean to evoke emotions, but at least you didn't cough. So <laughs> but it's not a blood test. So it's a naso, nasopharyngeal swab and then the test just takes four hours. It's not, you have to wait around there for four days. Am I positive or negative? Um, I just want to add something. Yes, it's a swab, but it's a swab that comes with a procedure to have it done. So yeah. it's not going to be willy-nilly just done by anyone. Yeah. Persons have to be in pro proper protective gear um, because of the possible risk associated with doing that swab droplets. And, and droplets that can yeah. be disseminated. So in other words, you would not be doing the swab. Yeah, so don't swab yourselves. Right. And, and, <laughs> right, and that's why we would, we would liaison with the public yeah. health officials that if there's a mm. suspected case, that person can be tested, that arrangements can be made to have that person tested. Testing is also done centrally because that's one way of easy surveillance. Yeah. Rather than have it done at several testing countries, Barbados is small enough that you know, t testing can be done centrally so that data all feeds into the Ministry of Health and Wellness immediately. Thanks for your question. That's okay. So remember we're streaming and the persons online cannot hear um, your question if you don't go to the mic. And what I would ask though is those persons that are on the right, um, closest to the mic, please do go to the mic. I know some of you guys might be a little bit um, uncomfortable going to the mic, so if you're over here, what I'll do is I'll try to repeat your question. But please, as, as much as possible, use the mics, okay? <laughs> All um, right, so the next question, please. No, sir, I just wanted to emphasize on the, I think the opportunity to expand on your question about testing. Uh, what, what's important for you is for you to know whether or not, one, you have traveled and traveled to a country where there's known to be what you call widespread COVID disease, or whether or not someone in your household or in your dorm have traveled to a country where there is disease. The reason why we're asking that because in Barbados as, at this time, there's no known case of COVID. So the only way you can get it, if you are exposed to someone who would have traveled and brought it back in your household or in your community. So if you know, so, so you have that responsibility to, to report and to, and, to ex, and to tell that to whomever be the, the, the doctor or, or the hotline person whom you're speaking to, okay? Okay, so we have a question from online. Yes. Um, the person asks, when Corona gets to Barbados, will KFL maintain the position outlined in the procedures and protocols sent via email, having online classes, or following Mona's lead, suspending classes temporarily? So the KFL campus is one campus of the University of the West Indies. The Mona campus is another, but they are on, in different territories. Responses to public health outbreaks are always territory specific. So it's not just you close down the entire university because we're one UE, although we are one UE for the television. So the KFL campus is following the national guidelines of Barbados. 
currently Barbados is still at stage zero or phase zero, so we cannot justify closing the campus in Barbados. If KFIL was in Jamaica, or for whatever reason the authorities there have made that decision, then that is, that is possible. So it's not based on the university, it's based on the territory. Okay. Well, and yes, we will be escalating. There is, a, there is a plan, which is a phased approach again. So again, it's not, you don't institute phase three or phase two um, procedures at phase zero. Uh, because then you dilute resources, healthcare professionals get exhausted, everything gets chaotic, and we have seen examples of this in other countries. Okay. What I would add to that as well, too, is that the University of West Indies takes its responsibility to its students very seriously. So we've already asked all lecturers to prepare a backup plan in case we cannot have face-to-face -face classes. And that has gone out a um, long time before this um, session was even conceptualized. Yeah. So we are planning for any potential eventuality, and we will not put our students at risk. Okay, so um, just keep that at the back of your mind. So next question. Okay, good night. Yes, please. Good night. There are some students who have traveled to the U.S. in case of um, for emergencies. So what would be the policy for those returning, those students returning from the U.S.? And if quarantine, where will they be quarantined? And how will they get food? Wow, I, I, I did price smart so I can answer the food thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, so the quarantine is, is not a campus-based decision. It's actually the National Health Authority, which is the Barbados Ministry of Health and Wellness. That decision is based on screening. Currently, the United States is not on a COVID list of countries for which, you know, so, you, so when you enter, you'll go through the same screening algorithm as if you were coming from Trinidad or wherever you're coming from to determine your risk. Based on that, then at the port of entry, a decision will be made about quarantine and testing, those kind of things. But that's not a campus decision. Um, I, I May I ask, just to follow up, are uh, you were aware of um, how long, an estimate as to how long they would be quarantined for? Because that would mean that they would be missing classes for two oh. weeks or a month and so on. Unless, of course, they're quarantined with their laptops. <laughs> so, so it's for, <laughs> it's for, <t> <laughs> Or your smartphones that aren't at WhatsApp. So it's 14 days. Uh, 14 days is the quarantine period, although there have been discussions, interestingly, uh, especially with the CDC, whether this period is a bit too long. Uh, but the current recommendation is still 14 days. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on the first question, I do know that depending where in the US you're traveling from, your screening might be different. So if they're yeah. where there are clusters of the outbreak, then the, the Ministry of Health, because they do check that when you come in, ask yeah. you where your origin, original place yeah. is from, where coming. So certain places, Washington, Washington is one that they will probably do a little more yeah. intense screening and decide if you need to go into quarantine. And um, as you said, if you're quarantined for the 14 days, we have already discussed that in terms of being given medical coverage, because you, you, you have to be quarantined, you have to be quarantined. You, you know, you can't do anything about that. Um, so at the clinic, once we're contacted, and if you're in quarantine, they give you a slip, and you just keep that slip, at, and whenever that is ended, and once you're well, you can always send that in, and you'd be covered for the period of absenteeism. Right. So it won't be a problem. Certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And remember that we, the you university has it. regulations for if students are ill. So the same regulations for when students are ill will kick in. So you yeah. wouldn't get an F if you were quarantined, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah? So you'll find ways of um, helping those students in that situation. And I'll be a little loose on the deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one more question. What if they come from the UK because that's a more high-risk area? Actually, the... Well, based on the information, the UK is not, um, the USA actually have more recorded cases than yeah. the UK. The U yeah. USA is actually probably over a thousand. The UK still record, UK meaning England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland are still about 400 and odd, three something from England, and 100 and odd of that from London. From London yeah. um, Scotland has about 30, and the others have less than 20. So they're not yet in the high risk areas. Thank you.
So thanks for highlighting that fake news, and it <laughs> it also emphasizes you can't you can't believe everything a president says. But the so the United Kingdom, for instance, is not on the Barbados's. I'm going to call it COVID list. Now, I just want to emphasize it's not a one-size-fit-all questionnaire because some people think it's just that you go into immigration and you click some questions. It's really directed based on how you respond. So, for instance, medical students who I know are in the back hiding, um, they, if you say, for instance, I went overseas on my elective or in the front hiding as well, and uh, I had contact with patients who were coughing and had fevers, I don't think you're going to be, well, you might do it. Uh, then, of course, your screen is going to be a lot more intense than if you say, I just went on a holiday, I didn't really go anywhere near a hospital, because they know that you're a higher risk if you're a medical student and you're interacting with patients. Uh, so your screening may be very different from, from that. But, of course, you have a civic responsibility to be honest mm -hmm. and to state, yes, I did have contact with a patient who had COVID-19, and I somehow got an aircraft, and, so, and that person will be quarantined, definitely. Okay. You have another question from online? I have a lot of people online. Mm -hmm. Yes. If, if classes go online, what would happen to students, to those site tech students who have labs? Ah. So, again, we have asked the faculties to develop uh, policies and procedures in, uh, for all of these situations because this is something that was raised yeah. in one of the discussions with the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology and he raised this as a potential also, issue. Yeah. So his faculty is supposed to be developing um, some protocols for that. Yeah, there are also issues, of course, in medical sciences because the medical students for their clinical exams have to see real patients and they can't be done virtually, although we're working on it. And uh, so it's, it's hard to test. Uh, but, of course, there are other ways of testing clinical skills over a period of time rather than in a formal clinical exam. Our final examination is, is, is also a high-risk exam because it involves examiners moving across the Caribbean circuit, across campuses. If one of us are infected, for instance, we can take it to Mona, St. Augustine, and Nassau. Or if we saw one patient at a clinical site who's infected, we could potentially infect an entire circuit of patients. And the same thing with students. So that's a high-risk exam, which the university is obviously considering carefully. All right. Next question. Is it possible to get the virus more than once? And if so, what are the chances of recovery? <laughs> Dr. Ewing. <laughs> um, well, first, uh, first of all, this, this is a new virus. This is the first outbreak. So we have not had that opportunity as yet to study whether or not persons who were infected and recover can be reinfected, okay? Um, so that is unknown at this point in time, okay? But as the, after the outbreak has subsided and you, and you see the level of immunity within the communities, then you will know whether or not someone would have developed immunity against the virus and then not be able to get reinfected with the same strain of the virus. But you know how viruses go. Um, <laughs> in, in terms of its mutation. Okay. I guess so one interesting point about this virus is, I wish I thought that someone here would have raised, it seems to, to, be rel to relatively spare younger people, and uh, especially children, but certainly people less than, than 19 years of age. And that's, that's actually not very unusual for some viruses because in many viral infections, the bad part of the infection is not really always the virus, but the body's response to the virus. And as you get older, your body's response may be a kind of a heightened response. It's almost like using a sledgehammer to kill an, kill an ant. So you, you develop severe disease of your lungs, which your body recognizes as this severe infection when it's really just a mild virus, and it really overshoots that reaction. You get very ill, and some patients have to go on a respirator, ventilator for support. Uh, for periods of time. Young people don't have that type of response, and therefore that's why younger people are probably doing better with COVID-19. Uh, but the virology is, is still being studied. It takes, it takes about two or three seasons, if this becomes seasonal, uh, to really understand the entire spectrum of disease symptoms and the virology of, of a virus. Uh, and if COVID-19 becomes an, an annual seasonal flu season, so in the five years time you look back, I was remember I was at university when they first had this COVID-19 thing, now I get COVID-19 every year, like COVID-22, <laughs> COVID-23, so 
and you're not even sure because it's, it's, it's now seasonal. And of course, the population has developed immunity over time as well. Okay, next question. Hi, good night. This question is for halls of residence particularly because there's so much um, residents using shared space and uh, for one specific hall there are what we call double rooms, space to persons. What the advice is that we wash our hands, etc. In the case that one of the residents is uh, confirmed to have the virus, what is the next step? Oh, well, the next step is easy. Mm. You report it. Uh, but then after reporting it, <laughs> after reporting it, then that, the people who are affected in that area will then need to be quarantined. Yeah? So if you are, you're in that room or even like on that, I don't know how halls are, on that block. For example, on a one, one floor with a double room, right. it's like 18 residents. In a room? No. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, okay. All right, I get you. Okay. The floor. Double room. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So the double room, that's two persons. Right. And you have, in all, on that floor with the shared space, like the uh -huh. kitchen and the bathroom, right. oh. is 18 persons. Right. So if one resident is confirmed to have the virus, yes. all 18 persons will be quarantined? That's correct. Including persons who they might have come, because some residents don't stay in the shared space. They might go to a next shared space. Right. The RAs, security. Yeah. They go to classes. Okay. Uh, let's, let's hear from Dr. Ewan. Okay. Um, we, we, we have to, in making decisions on what happened to someone, we have to rely on the science of, that we know of the disease. COVID-19, it is not an airborne disease, okay? So if I'm in this room with you, I'm sitting here and someone up there uh, who've had COVID-19, I don't have to just immediately rush out of this room because I think I'm going to inhale anything. No. Yes. One meter distance, someone who is infected with COVID-19, if they're symptomatic and they cough or sneeze, the droplets that exist within the cough or sneeze go into the air. It stays there for a while before it falls to the ground. It goes out about a meter or a meter or a meter and a half, and it falls to the ground. So after that, person's, after that person leaves the room, this room... If it falls to the ground, this room is still safe, meaning that you come into this room, uh, you, you will not get infected because it's not airborne, okay? Being in a hall of residence, yes, the person, definitely the person who's in that room with that person who is in close contact, that's why the definition is close contact with that person, will be the person who, most, who will be most likely quarantined. Now, quarantine means that you have been exposed. You don't have the disease, you don't have any symptoms of the disease, but you have been exposed and the period of quarantine is to watch you to see whether or not you develop symptoms of the disease. All right? And that's why we wait for the 14-day period because the, the incubation period between exposure and actually exhibiting signs and, signs and symptoms, symptoms of the disease is about 1 to 14 days. All right? Um, so the Ministry of Health will make the determination looking at where you live, who is living with you, as to whether or not those persons outside of your room, depending on your interactions with them, will be quarantined or not. The same thing goes for airplanes, persons traveling across the Atlantic on a jumbo jet, um, someone known to have COVID. It doesn't mean that they will quarantine all of the individuals who came on the jet. They will go Two seats behind, two seats to the side, two seats in front. Find out who those persons are, quarantine them. Those are protocols and policies that different countries develop, and we need to know what is Barbados' protocol, and it's in Barbados' plan, and they will tell you. So the most important thing is for you to say, I, have been, I may have been exposed because I was in close contact with this person on campus, in the room, or in play, 
or sitting next to them in the classroom, whatever, that's where you need to explain to the individuals. Good. Uh, next question. Most of what has been said has been addressed to the students at the campus, but what about the students at the hospital? I wonder who they would be. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be careful how I answer this. So students at the hospital, are, I'm assuming are medical students, and they, they fall under two categories. One, they are university students, but they're also healthcare workers, and there's a higher level of expectation in terms of universal healthcare um, precautions. If the university does decide that the, these students are at a higher risk, such that classes are canceled, classes are canceled, meaning clinical rotations, then that's a university decision. But certainly, whilst you're at the hospital, you should be having the same level of precaution, because at the hospital we all see patients, many of whom are coughing, some of them coughing a lot, uh, and some of them traveling and coughing, or coughing and traveling. So we, the same precautions will, will occur if you are a medical student. Uh, I do not think that you'll be put at a higher risk than the rest of your team. No one's going to say that. It's like a COVID patient out there. Let's send a medical student. Obviously, that's not going to happen because we understand that the, your purpose of being in the hospital is for learning, not treating COVID cases. Uh, so you will probably not be put at a higher risk. But by virtue of being in the hospital space, you are at higher risk for infections. Many of you who are in the, in the auditorium smiling, every year you do pediatrics in flu season. And you just have to walk past the pediatric ward and you start to get the flu and get symptoms. Uh, and, and you get other things like measles, those kind of things. So, so highly infectious diseases are still in hospitals. Uh, you have to take precautions. Great. Next question. Will the university look into having an industrial clean possibly over the weekend to aid in preventive measures? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I, think I, question. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think I can handle this one. Um, as I said earlier, the university has already put uh, policies and procedures in place. So we've been training our cleaners in mm -hmm. regards to how to clean spaces um, now. So our cleaners, <laughs> and it started since last week, um, our cleaners are supposed to be wiping down spaces uh, more regularly. We're supposed to get more garbage bins for the, um, for the rooms. Uh, because as we can see, some of the garbage bins fill up quite quickly. So if you put your tissue inside a garbage bin and it falls out on the ground, it can be sometimes problematic. So that was one of the decisions that we took to get more garbage uh, bins. But as we said earlier, that there has been no case in Barbados as yet. So what we're doing is putting in place um, procedures in case a, a case does occur to protect the campus and to protect the students. But just to reiterate, there is no case um, in Barbados or at the campus as yet. But we are trying to put procedures in place to ensure that there is no spread on the campus. Yes. So it's a good question about sanitation, but I think what is even more important, because the cleaners cannot clean everything that is likely to have been touched by a coughing, sneezing patient or person with COVID, like the doorknobs or the bathroom uh, doorknobs, etc. They can't clean everything every time. So it's important that you keep these hands clean. These hands clean, all right? And avoid touching your? Avoid touching? Yes. Good. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. Next question. I imagine the campus is providing guidance to students for self-management during this crisis. Is social distancing one of these guidelines? And if so, what is the policy regarding social events at the campus? It's a leadership question, but I almost feel unfair passing it to the DV. So the public health measures that are, are the, the three public health measures that are critical are proper hand washing, uh, avoiding touching your face or avoiding, avoiding men, as well as social distancing. So that's, those are three public health measures that kind of make sense to reduce viral spread. Uh, interestingly, what you're really doing in, this, in a population when you institute these public health measures, you're kind of spreading the cases out. Be, because 
as disease spread, those of you who look at viruses, if you don't have anything else to do, they, they kind of just shoot up in terms of they move from a low level and they exponentially rise. But we know that with public health measures, what happens is that that graph gets flattened. And you hear a lot about flattening the curve. That's what we're trying to do. Because if we don't flatten the curve, then several people all present to the healthcare set setting coughing and, and infected, and then the healthcare setting cannot handle it. Now, this may not mean that the actual numbers may not be the same over time, but at least the health system can now handle these numbers at, at a lower level. Now, in terms of social events, the campus has been very clear in following the national authority guidelines, which are very much aligned with PAHO WHO. It hasn't been just a chaotic, uh, let's cancel Carnival because Carnival, they cough a lot. I mean, it's, it's been very strategic and very evidence-based. For cancellation of public events for the national guidelines, this falls under stage three or phase three of the protocols, and we're at phase zero. Mm -hmm. So you have two phases to get through before you get there. Okay. But those stages may advance quickly. So, for instance, it is unlikely if an event is next week that it's going to be canceled, kind of thing. Universities have given advisories, obviously, to limit non-essential travel. I think this university has issued that advisory about non-essential travel. Obviously, you reduce risk. If you are going to be traveling to some place in China to deliver a paper, it's not critical. Uh, Zoom it or, or video conference, you don't have to travel for that. Why put, why, why put a population at risk just so you can present your paper in person? But it might be an important reason why you have to travel. In which case, if it is not one of the COVID-19 countries, because if it is, then I still want to advise you to travel. But if it isn't, you run the risk that when you leave this port, when you return, the border control policies may have changed. Don't get upset and say, well, when I left, the UK wasn't on your list. I left on the UK, the non-UK list. It, it can change during your, during your travel. Also, your airlines may cancel flights. You may not be able to get back. So these are rapidly developing th things, which, which makes us very uncomfortable because we like order and we like to know this is when I'm departing, this is when I'm arriving. You don't want to hear, oh, I can't come back to my country without being quarantined. But that is possible if you are doing non-essential travel. There was a question right here. And this is our guild president. Yes. Are you still a guild president? I okay, good. How many cases do we need uh, for, for the stages? So, like, Jamaica has two cases now. Right. So for the online audience, the question was, how many cases are needed for each of these stages? For stage one, stage two, all the way up to stage three or four. Yeah. Right. So I have that here. So stage one is one case or more. Uh, stage two is less than uh, 25 cases. Obviously, stage three is more than 25 cases. Uh, with these large clusters and human-to-human -human spread, uh, this increase in sustained transmission in the general population. And this is why you can understand then that that's why you will cut social gatherings, social events, those kind of things, yeah? All right. To, to put it in public health terminology, there are three, what we call the, the three C's. First case, case, first case. So Barbados is, is in the position now to identify its first case. Um, the second C is clusters. With clusters, you contain. So if you have a dormitory with 10 or 15 individuals in that dorm, uh, we identify you. What you try to do is to contain it, make sure no one in that dorm gets on the outside. You identify the person, you quarantine the rest, you, uh, and you're right. Um, after that is what you have community, community transmission. With community transmission, then you, do go, you go into the mitigation phase where there's social distancing. You try to keep people apart, stop public gathering. That's the only way you're going to break the cycle and stop the transmission. So that is when governments start to consider things like cancellation of mass events, major events, send you home from school, no one could keep in a room like this. The only reason why we could have this gathering here is because we're still in phase zero. Phase zero. Phase zero. All right. Okay. 
All right, next question. Hi, good night. Um, my question is, for example, Barbados is an unaffected country, and they have taken measures such as like screening and quarantine. Mm -hmm. Now, is it that screening and quarantine is a compulsory measure for each country, or is it discretionary? Because I am aware that there are countries who are not doing any screening because they are unaffected. I, okay, I'm not sure. I would think that all countries are screening. As to the level of screening that they're doing, that might vary from country to country. But certainly all countries, I think, are paranoid enough. Certainly they should be uh, at their border to really control entry of who is coming in. Now, some countries I've heard that might be a, as much as a two-question questionnaire, which is obviously not adequate. Other countries, Barbados has a tiered approach questionnaire, which can get quite detailed. Uh, but all countries are screened, and if you are suspected, then you should be quarantined. But it's all a country-based guideline and, and, and protocol. Countries are, so there's no, there will never be a, well, let me not say that, because we are under CARICOM, but there's unlikely to be a CARICOM-wide kind of screening policy. It will always be country-specific. Uh, each country has, deserves the right to determine how intense they will screen, who they allow into their country. Like they can randomly say, I am not going to allow Europe overnight with no valid reason. So that's possible, but you, so it's, it's very country specific. Um, Thank you. And, and there are some countries who say once you travel to their country, no matter where you're from, you must be quarantined for 14 days. Some people are as extreme as that, yeah. so it varies. Okay. We have a question over here. Okay. Right. So the question is, have we put a contingency plan in place if the halls have to be closed down? Um, Dr. Connell, do you want to take the first part? <laughs> There is a contingency plan in place. Uh, the, sorry. You want me to say it? Yeah. So obviously, if, if halls have to be have to be shut, in other words, a large population of students need to be quarantined. The, the the campus's policy is not to quarantine on hall. First of all, so hall is not going to be converted into a giant quarantine site, as has been rumored on various platforms. So the quarantine sites in Barbados, and there are four of them, I just don't remember exactly what they are, but there are four of them. Paragon, Paragon St. Lucie District Hospital, and two others that are more central. Uh, the government quarantine sites. So if you are under mandatory quarantine, you can't be under mandatory quarantine on the hall, uh, because that converts your hall basically into a quarantine site. Now, the question is really what, be, what happens if a large number of students on hall are infected? Right. So the, the key thing about why we're having these public education campaigns is that as soon as you feel ill, call the clinic yeah. so that you don't expose other members of the halls. We don't want to be in a situation where we have a large number of students infected. Yeah. We have the clinic, um, just pick up the telephone, all of us have cell phones, just pick up the, don't go to the clinic, remember that, that was one of the pieces of advice from Dr. Whitby Best, do not go to the clinic, you're going to call the clinic and say that I have these symptoms, what do you recommend, mm -hmm. and she will then direct you from, from there, okay? And that way we prevent the transmission of, of the virus on the halls. And I, Think that once we all follow good advice, that this would that that would not be a scenario that we have it's, to consider. Um, it's unlikely. Just, yeah, as, sorry, as you mentioned cell phones, because I keep forgetting this. I know that that many people are on their cell phones quite often, and one way of transmitting might be yeah. your hands with your cell phone mm -hmm. and putting it to your face, and so you're not avoiding men, but you're avoiding phones. But the so use earpieces if possible, so that you aren't doing this constant face to hand maneuver just for this season. No, the university will not reimburse um, your earpieces. Sorry? I'm not if sure if some conversations can be heard on speaker, but if you think it's safe, uh, speaker phone, yeah. So try not to do the whole face, face, to, face to hand maneuver. Yes. Um, just to follow up from that, that um, clinic staff has been um, educated, updated with information. All the doctors have been 
um, given information coming from the ministry, they're encouraged to read up to on their own and make sure they're up to date with what's happening so mm -hmm. that, you know, m not just one person can guide and answer questions. I also want to add some comfort to the student community that we are not just kind of going home at night and watching CNN uh, and kind of making up the rules as, as we see episodes. So, so the Campus Health Medical and Health Services Committee meets remotely. Uh, not that we don't think that anyone's infected, but we meet re remotely. And we construct and we develop plans and we revise plans based on evolving evidence. And that happens currently on a weekly basis, but if it has to be more often, they may kill me for this, but it will be more often because we have to make sure that whatever policy is instituted at this campus is as up to date as the evidence allows us to make that decision. Yes. Yes, please. So we have another question. Good night. Um, there's an online petition signed by some 830 students. I just wanted your statement, Deputy Principal. And um, secondly, it appears to me, I've been listening, that we are waiting for COVID-19 to come. <laughs> so why don't you just send us home and prevent all this? It's a pandemic. <laughs> so uh, before you leave, um, there, before you leave, I, I want you to clarify a little bit. So there are lots of online petitions. So can you clarify the online petition There's, you're referring to? So I, I saw the petition because it was shared. Uh, by a student. Uh, so there's an online petition going around signing to have the Cavehill campus closed. Oh, uh, okay. And I think the last conk I saw was 800 and something. Uh, and it's, it's kind of cool because you can see as the number increases it moves towards mm -hmm. and it changes color. But that's, I mean that's, as entertaining as that is, again, the, the campus has to follow national policy and, and, and and you should not think that prematurely shutting the, the campus down does anything, except that maybe you get some more time off. Because countries have done it and have failed. They've done the experiment. They've done the, oh, let's, be, let's just shut everything down two weeks before and see what happens. And they haven't done any better. So there is public health evidence as to when these procedures are implemented. And they're not driven by online petitions. Yeah. And the, the university takes the, the views of its students very seriously. And you have a mechanism for communicating to campus management in terms of your views. So we have the guild uh, president here, and she's involved, and she gets communication from us in terms of any new issues. So last week, Friday it was, we had a meeting of the campus management, and mm -hmm. the guild president was invited to that meeting. She heard about she all of there. the things that we were um, discussing and thinking about putting in place to protect the, the, the students on, on campus. So this is not something that we take lightly. We take the, the safety and health of our students very seriously, but we have to be driven by the science and we have to be driven by national guidelines in regards to the University of the West Indies, okay? Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> well, what else do you want from, from me? Well, yes. as I said, prevention yes. is better than cure. Right, and we, and we have identified a number of areas of prevention. Mere public education, in my opinion, yes. does not force any person to call the hotline, mm -hmm. don't go to the clinic, or basically be you know, clean and you know, have manners. I just feel unsafe, and everybody does, I am certain. Okay. Um, so I think the, the most that I think any institution can do is to provide a, a, a safe environment and communicate what they're doing to provide a safe environment. There will always be persons that would not be satisfied with what you're doing, but you have to, be, um, have to do as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you that the campus is doing as much as it can to protect its students, okay? Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> All right, next question. All right, this is a question that was missed earlier. Okay. You mentioned the MBBS exam being a high-risk exam. What can final year students expect for the May 2020 period? I'm thinking that comes from a medical student. So the, the, the decision about the, 20, the May 2020 clinical exams has not been made as yet to my knowledge. It will be discussed 
through the, and approved or reviewed by the Board of Undergraduate Studies because it's an undergraduate degree. And recommendations will also be made to the Office of the Campus Principal at Cave Hill Campus. But remember, this is a cross-campus exam where all three campuses and clinical site at Nassau are all taking the same exam, so we all have to agree. Now, one, what an individual campus might say, for instance, is that, is that well, our examiners are not going to leave Cave Hill to go to Mona to examine, uh, which in itself causes problems because the Mona exam kind of relies on a certain number of examiners coming from all the different campuses. So it's something that, that certainly has to be carefully considered. And I know that a lot of our medical students are aware on it, on their electives, studying very hard for their final exams in May. Uh, but we will let you know as once this is decision has been made. Now this is a different type of decision because it's now, it's now governed by several territories. And so this is, a, this is the first kind of cross-territory decision, but it's, it's an important one and we'll have to communicate it to you. Okay. All right. Um, do we have an online question? There are, but... Okay. You can make up one. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I'll just repeat the question. So um, is the school considering an extension of the semester in case we have to go online in terms of submitting your assignments? Um, so not all students might have access to a computer, for example, those, those type of things. So when we, had, when we had the meeting with the principal, the principal said that um, once we get to a scenario where the population is at risk, the students are at risk, the university has a duty of care. Mm -hmm. to provide for its students. And if our students cannot come to the campus or they cannot um, submit their assignments on time before, because they're quarantined, university will react to suit, right? So we, would re the, we have a number of procedures and policies in place. We have orals, we have take-home examinations. So we, we have lots of options in place that we can utilize. But we will um, always do so within the guidelines of the regulations. Um, to make sure that everyone has a fair chance at their degree. Yeah. Yes, please. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to find out, uh, because the, the repositories around the school where you normally go to get the hand sanitizer, some of them have been um, depleted for the past two days, like the yes. one inside the library, yes. which normally controls a large flow of traffic. Yes. So is it possible that that can be refilled within the hour or so of it being depleted. Because they asked the security guard not too long ago mm -hmm. about it, quote unquote, but sorry. And he said it's, 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 it's not really in his job description to basically, you know, get out of your film. Mm -hmm. No, I ain't tell you nothing, but I just want to know if it's possible that no. it could be filled <laughs> at the end of the year as soon as possible. Because why, because why I, I just had to allow him to know that right now there's a seminar going on and it's very important that he, he you know, takes himself more seriously than the money that he's getting because why, at the end of the day, no amount of money is more for more than your health. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know if it's possible that because that we would like to stay at a level zero or stage zero, if it's possible that on a regular basis, mm -hmm. when it is that it's reported to campus security and whatnot, if it is that it can be dealt with in the in, 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 no, you know, is, the, the swiftest manner. That is a great recommendation. Um, coming out of the meeting that we had last mm -hmm. Friday, the principal would have um, communicated to in place mm -hmm. that we need to have more uh, dispensers around Correct. the campus. That and we need to refill them more often. Correct. So I will take your feedback back to the registrar Correct. And, and ask that we have those refilled a lot more often. Obviously, yeah. people are using them a lot right. more frequently now, so, so they need to be refilled more often. Often. Right, because so the demand we'll is a lot feedback. more. Um, so, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Connell would have mentioned that there is a, his committee has a WhatsApp group. So, the campus management also has a WhatsApp group where these type of, um, this type of feedback can be communicated very quickly to senior management. So, as soon as we complete this, I'll, I'll just send a message to campus management about that. Um, right. I, I would like to just respond to we're also encouraging the hand washing because yeah. if you you might be mindful to note hand sanitizers are in short supply worldwide. Yeah. So when we run out, we might not be able to refill quickly or because, or because we might not be able to get any. Yeah. So 
in a case where you can hand wash instead of using the hand sanitizer, that might be preferred, considering we have a hat, we don't have any cases yet. Um, just so that we can conserve on supplies until we really need to. Uh, but just be mindful, and if anyone is looking, I've been looking for hand sanitizers for weeks. They have been out of stock in Barbados for weeks. And if you hear somewhere have it, by the time you call, it's gone. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. Alcohol, all of these things. So just be mindful that supplies is another problem. So we might not be able to readily get more because it's, a, it's not just a Barbados problem, it's a worldwide problem. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next question. Okay, I think this is possibly apparent. Is there any possibility of doing online classes for the rest of the school year and inclusive of exams if I wanted to bring a student home? Is this an option for foreign students? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll yeah, see you um, from the medical professionals. So as we said earlier, um, the, we are currently at the stage where there has not been any confirmed case of the coronavirus in Barbados. Um, we are therefore working or preparing for if there is a case, and we have therefore asked all of the faculties and all of the lecturers to put a plan B in place so that if classes need to go online, we can take the classes online. There currently is no need to put that plan in place because there is no case of the coronavirus in Barbados. But as soon as that occurs and as soon as the, the principal and the vice chancellor makes the decision to close the campus, we will move the classes online if that needs to occur. Okay? But at the moment we're not at that stage and there isn't any need to... Exactly. I, I, we, we just need to reiterate the fact that we're, we're currently at the stage where there are no cases. So why close the campus if there are no cases of the coronavirus in Barbados? Yeah, I just want to reiterate that, the, that many of, so for medical sciences, a lot of the courses have plan Bs where the instructional design has been changed so that assessment can be done online. Uh, a lot of our assessment already are computer-based assessments except for the clinical exams. And there are other ways that we can assess clinical skills without a clinical exam involving patients. So that's something that we, can, we, we have considered. Uh, and certainly I know that the, the deans, in fact the university dean for medical sciences is currently the K. Phil campus dean, is, they're currently considering that as an, as an option for assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions? I just wanted to, to just yeah. comment on the indiscriminate use of, of hand sanitizing gel because sometimes even when I'm walking into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I see some people taking what could only be a shower with the hand sanitizing gel. You know, they're there and they're literally going like this one because they want to get it real wet. Uh, and then it's wet and then it takes forever to dry. So they touch something and they're not sanitized because the hands are not dry. So you have to be careful how you're using hand sanitizer gel. The correct technique is critical. You can actually demonstrate it here. So you know you form your ladder, right? And then you rub the back of your hands, both hands. A little bit, a little bit higher, Dr. Connell, because your, your computer is broken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I didn't want my mark to get in the way. So rub the back of your hands, back of your hands, both sides. You want to get your thumbs in, which people always forget that this is actually a digit here at the side. The thumbs. Nails need to be, I said this in another form, your nails need to be trimmed. You can't hand sanitize with long nails because one part in hand sanitizing is tips. Now if you're going, unless you're going to kind of dig into your skin, you can't get to, you have to remove nails to hand sanitize properly. And then the interlocking as well at the tip. Hand sanitizing should take at least 20 seconds. But some people I have seen, I've actually seen this on, on, on in a, I wouldn't say which hospital, but counting 20 seconds and just doing nothing, just to kind of, it's 20 seconds of actively washing your hands in the various stages and steps. Remembering the thumbs and the tips, both, both sets of tips. So ladies and gents actually, you're, you're going to have to trim your nails for COVID-19. It could be the COVID-19 cut, you can call it. No nails for COVID-19. <laughs> okay. Next online question. Oh, yeah. All right, so persons online are just asking for clarification. In the event that there is a situation, stage one or, or otherwise, mm -hmm. 
is the campus ready to roll out that plan, or you, or you have to wait for stage one to decide what that plan will be? Uh, the campus is ready um, to, make, to ensure that its students can continue their education, and we have been uh, working behind the scenes to put that, in place, that plan in place, if that's clear enough. Well, they're asking for an outline of the plan. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much of an outline I can provide. Because each faculty is going to be different. So the faculty yeah. of medical sciences is going to have to use a different approach than the faculty of science and technology and the faculty of social sciences and the faculty of law. So each faculty and their faculty reps would have that information communicated to them. So there are going to be faculty boards coming up very soon. So um, what I would suggest is that you, your, your guild rep is going to be at those faculty board liaise meetings. Liaise with your faculty. Um, yes. Liaise with your guild rep to get that information from the faculties and how they approach the, the issue. There are campus-wide triggers. For instance, stage three is a campus-wide trigger. If, if, if we reach stage three, then it's more than likely that the campus will, will be closed at stage three because there's pers the person spread um, community spread. So, so that, that is campus wide, but then stage one and two, those, those kind of interventions are very much faculty specific, I think, interventions. Okay. So, right. Right. Okay. So, so the guild rep has suggested that once they get the information from the faculties, she would put it in the public information uh, forum. That's good. Okay, and you'll have access That'd be to excellent. that. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. All right, and hopefully this can be the final. Um, there's an there's an expectation that it's not a matter of if, but when. And the University of the of K the Kfield campus has made a decision to close. What about those students who are not able to travel, go home? Will the university still be there in a supportive manner um, to of assist course them? You, of I mean, your university. But, but education aside, they're talking yeah. about their well-being now. You are University of West Indies students. You're. Um, you have keep, you've come to the University of West Indies for your education, but we still consider you part of the UE family, and we're not going to just leave you aside. Like the question that we had earlier about what happens if you're quarantined, if you're going to get food or, or stuff like that, um, the University of West Indies would ensure that you are sufficiently provided for if anything is supposed to happen. So um, I don't think that is too much of a concern. You are part of the UE family, and we will take care of our, the members of the UE family. Have a question? Yeah, yes, please. And we, uh, we are not waiting. We're either. not waiting either. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not, so each, as I said earlier, each faculty needs to give an outline. I can't say, for example, that the faculty of law is going to do X and the faculty of science and technology is going to do Y. Each faculty will report to, the, to their reps what they're going to do, and the guild president has indicated that she'll communicate that to you. Okay? So if you leave here, for instance, and you go outside and you hear there's a case, which is a possibility, you should expect that by tomorrow, you should hear from your faculty what the plan is. Yeah. Of course, yeah. It should, you shouldn't hear about it next week. Certainly, by medical, in medical sciences, you'll, you'll probably hear about it tonight as well, if it happened tonight. But it has to be as urgent. There's, there's some urgency, and I don't want students to leave with the impression that there's kind of a, a WhatsApp group going on saying, oh, shoot, we're at phase one now. What do we, what do, we do now? Kind of thing. There's, there, there is a plan, you know, there's a plan in place for stage one, stage two, stage within your faculty. They just need to tell you what that plan is. I'm just saying that there's some campus-wide policies. For instance, the campus can't close and law decides, well, we're the faculty of law and we want to stay open. You see, so there's some campus-wide things that will be done as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been asked by public information, so I now call Mark Holm. Did I get that right? Mark Holm. Please ask students to check their email addresses as this will be the first line of communicating with them. This is one of my pet peeves. Sometimes I send very urgent emails out to students and I, and I hear them. Did you check your email? 
not last week, but the week before I, I checked through it, or it went to my junk phone. You have to be very vigilant. This is not something to check your email once every week. Check your email at least twice a day. Of course, there are lots of social media postings that are going around. Follow uh, the Office of Student Services. Follow Seru. We post everything. I mean, this I have to say that Campus Medical and Health team, we are kind of obsessive about communication, and we do try to get the information out as quickly as possible. We spend a lot of our time doing myth busting, by the way. Uh, you know, it's like, like lemon juice, chill lemon yeah. juice. You know, it's not going to kill. Ice cream. Or avoiding ice cream is going to help a you. A slice of lemon. A slice of lemon. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we spend a lot of time dispelling myths. But sometimes these myths, because with every epidemic or viral outbreak will come concerns, and if you don't know about the virus, then you're going to be even more concerned. So some of these things are not as crazy as, as some people may think they are. People get very anxious. For instance, I know, for instance, in one space, a student might have come back from a certain country and, and, and cough. And of course, the, uh, this person went to this country that has COVID-19, and now you've infected all of us kind of thing, and we need to shut the halls down. And it's, so overreaction never helps in public health issues. Again, there are examples of when countries have overreacted, what has happened. It, it just does not work. So to the person who wants to travel home before, at stage step zero, you could be traveling home to COVID, having left campus. Uh, so it's, it's following a stepwise approach. Okay. Next question, or that was the no more online questions? Well, there's just one question, but. Sure. No, the national policy. The person is asking about what's the national policy. Okay. The so national policy is very detailed. Mm -hmm. It's 50 something pages. And that's one off. And it's, it's in its first version, so you can expect that it will be expanding. And this national policy just hasn't been dreamt up because of COVID 19. It's, it's followed protocols from other viral outbreaks and built on those, but it's specific for COVID 19. And it's been, we've been following it. Certainly, this campus has followed the national policies almost verbatim. Almost every day, Dr. Ewing gets a WhatsApp or a call or something saying, there's this question, I just want to make sure that we are following the policy of PAHO of, of, and the national policy, because we just can't be making decisions randomly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask each member of the panel to maybe give us uh, some final words before we close tonight's session. Um, Dr. Ewing, do you want to start first? Or... Just a reminder um, that of the clinic number and um, if you have any risk and have symptoms, feel free to call. Remember the national hotline also. Um, we're here to support and to help and we will do our best to do that. So just want to remind you of that. Okay. And Thanks practice good hand hygiene. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Ewing? There's a lot of fake news out there, misinformation, myths. What you need to do is to check the real source of information. You can, I think you have a campus site. Because um, whatever they put out, I can guarantee you that it will be from a credible source like WHO, the Ministry of Health, PAHO. Um, because if you, if you listen to the fake news, you can put yourself at risk. There's no treatment for the disease. There's nothing you can take to prevent it. Okay? The only thing you can do to prevent it, wash your hands with soap and water or hand sanitizers. Cover your cough. Don't spread it to others. Stay away from people who are coughing and not covering their cough, and to avoid, to avoid what? Men. Men. Yes. Avoid touching men. So, so I'm just going to end by saying that, uh, you know, even as I said to the Campus Medical and Health Services Committee, we are part of a, a society. We're not just this isolated, protected committee. 
any one of us here on this panel tomorrow could be diagnosed as positive with COVID-19. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to our community, the same responsibility that you have to yourself and your community. Your university has a responsibility to make sure that you are managed in the most evidence-based way possible, and this committee has the responsibility of, of advising the campus principal what are the best policies that are in place and recommending that they be instituted. I advise all of you to, to behave sensibly, be alert, and be also conscious that things may change. So, so if in two weeks' time there is, I don't know, no mass gatherings at stage two, don't go on WhatsApp or on social media and say, he said stage three, how it get to stage two? Now, it changed because the national policy has changed. This is not a concrete policy, and this is something that is dynamic because this virus, a lot of it, a lot is not known. I hope that all of you have a safe remainder of the semester here with us at Cave Hill and eventually travel home to your countries COVID-free uh, for an enjoyable holiday. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. So just as uh, just final words, the, the campus has a plan in place. It, it will be always in line with the national policies. And we will continue to communicate uh, to you the progress of COVID-19 throughout the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Hopefully there are no cases in Barbados, but we, if there are any cases, we will continue to communicate to you, with you as much as possible. Okay? All right. Do have a great night. Thank you. I saw this and I actually jumped because it's from the Ministry of Education. I just saw there will be no school. That's Jamaica. No, no, this is Barbados. There's only one school.